Thanks, Peter, and good day to everyone. Nice to be here. Been wanting to come to IWH for a long time. Um, so it's finally occurred. All right. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about our group before launching into the talk. We have a, a, a small group of six or eight of us that work on occupational health as our base, but we have some Oc Health psychs, social epidemiologists, um, and that's really org psychs are, are, are our main group as well. So our, our goals are to, as Peter said, advance the scientific and public understanding of, of work as a social determinant, and then try to apply that to improving uh, the quality of people's working lives. Um, this, we collaborate widely, and a lot, a lot of these people will, will have contributed to the work that you're going to hear, um, as you'll hear about in this talk, and so I just want to acknowledge them at the outset. Um, so work and mental health, on to the topic of uh, today's presentation. Um, this obviously is, is an area of great interest in, in the Institute as well. It's a growing concern for workers, for employers, for workers' comp schemes, disability insurance schemes, and so on. You've all seen these various sort of little facts about the high prevalence of common mental disorders in the working population and so on. I'm not going to read through those. But um, I don't think I need to convince this audience that there's, uh, there's plenty to look at in this space. Um, and in particular, what we'd really love to have is solutions to some of work-related mental health problems. And we typically tend to think first for solutions-oriented research towards experimental designs, the gold standard of, of causal inference, if you will. These are characterized by random assignment to different treatment or intervention conditions. <coughs> um, we have the greatest ability to attribute observed changes to the intervention and not other things with these sorts of designs. And here, the key feature, too, is that the researcher manipulates the exposure or allocation to, to treatment or intervention group. So ideally, um, in this language I'll use um, going into the talk, the individuals who are randomized to different conditions are exchangeable but for the exposure. Um, and this is something we're going to come back to in trying to maximize this in natural experiments. Um, so just to let you know, this is, we do the first kind. The natural experiments is something we're developing in parallel to our field intervention research. So I'm just going to take a back step and tell you about a trial. Peter's involved in this and, and a large group of people in Melbourne. <laughs> um, we're working in Victoria Police. In Australia, there's one police force in the whole um, uh, state or province. It's uh, an organization of 15,000 people. About 12,000 are sworn um, police officers. <coughs> We've spent about three years looking at the way things work there. They, they came to us really driven by rising claims and suicides in police, um, in police members. And so first, we need to get to know the context. And this is one of the slow bits and bits that's harder to get funded in intervention research. But we spent a few years doing qualitative work and survey work, trying to figure out um, what was possible, what the organization was ready to do. And then that led on, <coughs> and I'll show you what we designed as a result of that. That led on to us getting um, a large cluster randomized trial funded. And by the end of it, we'll have um, randomized 24 stations to intervention or control. Um, and we're in the midst of that now. So this is what it looks like after three years of, of um, uh, development work. This was the intervention we developed that we could test. And um, so we have a range of activities um, directed at certain target groups, our primary outcomes, and then our just secondary outcomes, if you will. So um, lots of things came up about poor leadership and coaching, particularly this is a very young organization, a lot of young police officers coming in, a bit of an experience gap. So we're focusing a lot of our intervention energy <coughs> on helping sergeants and senior sergeants to better mentor and look after junior coppers. Um, but there's also um, mental health literacy directed to, this, to the command as well as to the troops about mental health literacy that is being aware of common mental disorders that they're often treatable, um, trying to do destigmatization such that you would optimize help seeking and so on. And then it's things around stress management and <coughs> uh, workload in particular. An interesting thing came out was well, a major stressor for a lot of young coppers is, is the, um, the bureaucratic part because they, they have an interaction with somebody in the street, um, leads to an arrest, and the paperwork that follows. Um, they didn't go into the job for that. So curiously, it came up as quite a feature in the qualitative work is the distress that um, young coppers would feel trying to deal with the paperwork. So in short, um, we would direct our intervention activities to these groups, and that's fairly limited, right? 
It's a lot more about work in mental health you could do. So now all that work funneled down to this. This is what was feasible. This is what they were ready for. <coughs> and we have an evidence base for. Um, and we hope, therefore, to improve mental health literacy and uh, working conditions, in particular supervisory support, which was, which was very low. And if we can do this, then we hope that might improve uh, perceived job stress, mental health, and um, work productivity and performance. Um, now, the challenges are, <laughs> you know, this was a lot of development work, huge grant, was hard to get, but we managed to get it. We're now um, five, there's two and a half years in the trial, five years or so, and we've published one paper. <laughs> um, you know, this is a familiar phenomenon to many of you, the, the, the difficulties, the challenges. This work is critically important, but it's really difficult. Expensive, long timelines, high effort, low publication yield. Uh, and then, of course, we have, you know, if the police commissioner changes, <laughs> the whole project could disappear. Uh, I exaggerate to make the point, but as some of you in the room will know these things can happen. Um, and then, of course, whenever you do an intervention study, you get the groups that are most ready to make change. And how generalizable is that to the full working population? Well, maybe not entirely. And then, of course, <clears throat> all might be going well, and then there's a restructure, or perhaps a global financial crisis. Um, and so the internal and external threats to these studies are substantial as well. And then, of course, um, you can't really do trials on things that are potentially harmful. Temporary employment, for instance. Are you going to randomize people to temporary versus permanent? Probably not. Um, so um, in the face of these challenges, um, we can look to natural experiments. And that's where we'll go now with the talk. Um, <coughs> we have data sources, usually secondary, um, that have repeat measures over time, either within an individual or cross-sectional, doesn't really matter. You can capture natural experiments. So I define that, taking this from an MRC, it's a nice review by the Medical Research Council in the UK a couple of years ago, as events, interventions, or policies that are not under the control of researchers, but which are amenable to research by exploiting that variation in exposure to analyze the impact of that event or experiment. Um, the key features are that it's not undertaken for research purposes, and hence the naturally occurring uh, phrase. And the variation in exposure <laughs> is, is analyzed by methods that attempt to make causal inferences. So you're essentially treating assignment or allocation of subjects to as if it were random, which we know in, in usually it is not. Uh, in short, you're trying to apply experimental thinking to a non-experimental situation. Um, and so to emphasize the limitations, you're still basically doing secondary analyses on observational data. You have non-random assignment of exposure, so you can be loaded with bias of all kinds. Um, and you have limited exchangeability of exposed and non-exposed. So for instance, the people who um, are exposed to a given event might be very different from those who are not exposed. And you've got a lot of confounding there. Um, <laughs> but despite these limitations, if we're able to um, access existing data, then efficiency-wise, this is fantastic. Sample size, you tend to have much larger samples than you do in trials. Um, and generalizability is a really key feature when you have a population-based data set. You have much greater generalizability than your trials usually will have. Um, and you can then go to town conceiving natural experiments and seeing if you can extract them from those data sets. And <laughs> the analytic methods um, that are used, uh, I've put in a list of, list of them here, those that are reviewed in a couple of things. There's that MRC um, review, and by the way, the slides will be provided. You, you all probably know that. <laughs> um, so the references for those interested are here. Um, there's another review uh, uh, in a text that's there, and Slavis is one, Shelvis, sorry, is one that just came out in the Scan Scandinavian Journal. Um, and many of you will know of these interrupted time series, propensity score matching, um, discontinuity regression, and so on. Um, and there's one <coughs> other that could be added to this list that isn't in any of these reviews, and that's fixed effects regression. It's relatively new to epidemiology. Um, it comes from econometrics. It's not new there. Um, and that's what we're going to focus on um, going forward here. So I'm adding something a little different, really, to that list of um, anal analysis strategies. So what's fixed effects regression? Well, it emulates experimental designs by um, 
optimizing exchangeability of the exposed and non-exposed. And it does that by looking at within-person changes. So you need repeated measures over time within person to use fixed effects regression. And <coughs> each person is his or her own control. Um, and so because of that, time invariant confounding goes away. Race, ethnicity, early childhood experiences, you know, other things that might be relevant. Um, <coughs> and uh, you, you um, ha optimizing exchangeability and removing time invariant confounding. And it's done by mean centering, which is sort of a uh, technical detail. Now, of course, it has limitations <coughs> because it only uses within individual variation. Um, and you, you can have small numbers. When you get down to those who change in exposure, which are the ones that contribute to the beta coefficients, you can have small numbers. You can lack precision. And of course, there's no parameter estimates for time invariant confounders, which might be of interest to you. If so, this isn't your method. And only where changes in exposure occur um, does that contribute to the beta coefficients. And so this is really about um, difference or change in exposure is critical. Everything else falls out. Um, so when you want to look at, say, somebody who stays in high control, high job control, what effect does that have on mental health? This isn't your method. Changes or differences in job control, this you can use. <coughs> and um, of course, we have the usual problems, time varying confounding, life events, um, whatever. Uh, and reverse causation, other things, this doesn't fix any of that. So it gives us some advantage. So let's go through, I had three examples, it's, it was too long, so we're gonna skip that one, but I've left it in the slides for those who are interested. Um, so we'll look at the job task level, <coughs> at job control and mental health, and then we're gonna look at um, an analysis around temporary employment or precarious employment. Oops, what did I do there? Ooh, pressed the wrong button. Oh. I put it to sleep. Okay. Um, all right. So the first one. Um, most of the evidence around job control and mental health um, tells us that poor job control or deteriorating job control um, is harmful to mental health. But what we really want to know is if we improve job control, will we improve mental health? That's the intervention question, right? The policy to practice question. So that's how we framed our, our research question. <coughs> um, and <coughs> We have a data source in Australia that's a large <coughs> panel survey that's been running since 2000. It's called HILDA. And um, it's face-to-face -face interviews and self-completion questionnaires, fairly good uh, response rates. And um, in this analysis, we're using the first 10 waves, which is uh, about 13,000 people and about four or five observations per person on average. Um, our mental health outcome is the MCS mental component summary of SF36. And um, you can see there the, it's a mean of around 50. Our job control measures, here we are at the secondary uh, data problem. This is not an ideal job control measure, but it's 10 waves, <coughs> and so we, we use it anyway. Low alpha, 0.4, should be around 0.8. Um, from two equally weighted subscales, decision authorities usually has at least three items. That's fine. Skill discretion usually has a lot more. Not so good. Individually, they look okay. When you put them together, the alpha falls down to 0.4, which is concerning. Um, but as you'll see, we, we try to look at that. We treat this continuously, crude measure, and then also divide it into quintiles for reasons that will be apparent in just a moment. So again, the fixed effects regression, um, I've already said all that. So essentially what we're doing is comparing mental health uh, within individual at times of high control, middle, low, or by quintile. And that's essentially what we get. The coefficient, the beta coefficient that's yielded is for a person who has been in different quintiles of job control. It compares their mental health across those quintiles. And that's what you get. So to illustrate, <coughs> um, we got two study, this is just made up data, two study participants, 10 waves over time. and and see here, this is the person's individual. I mean, these are arbitrary, these units. It's just to illustrate that people can start from different places in control or mental health. And their own mean is <laughs> their own reference. And you can see here, this is, this is fabricated to show an association between um, mental health and control. As control goes down, mental health goes down, so on. You know, we don't know that that's the answer yet. <coughs> but 
Um, what this will do is it will say, okay, for the for job control, say at two, uh, it's going to compare, say, these these two. It's going to look at mental health at those two points. It ignores sequence and temporality. This is a key point of fixed effects regression when it's done in the straight way, and it'll average mental health at the low one, two, three, four, five quintiles, and compare them to each other. <coughs> All right, and so um, that's a key. That's, I hope that helps illustrate a little bit the uh, discussion. So what about the temporal relationship between job control and mental health? Because we're using a scaled measure, we've gone with contemporaneous, not put any lags in. Putting lags in fixed effects models is a little bit complicated, uh, um, but still, it's really a theoretical justification here that <coughs> um, you can have a contemporaneous previous studies. One of a uh, Dutch study shows that within a year, scaled measures of mental health um, a contemporaneous, contemporaneous association is probably the best fit. Um, if we were looking at a dichotomous outcome, um, obviously it might require longer exposure, or cumulative, or whatever. But because we're looking at a scaled measure, we thought this was okay. So what happened with job control? These are the various things that might happen, um, and not even exhaustive, from one wave to another. Do people stay the same? Do people change a lot? You know. Um, what does it look like? So here's um, an illustration of three, three, um, three possible change scenarios. Someone who starts in the lowest quintile at time t, so any, any wave in the 10, one wave later, where do they end up? And this is the answer. Most likely, someone who starts at the lowest quintile is going to stay in the lowest quintile, far and away the most likely. And then with decreasing frequency, people shift all the way up to the top within one year. Conversely, if you start at the top, where are you a year later? Most likely still at the top, and then falling. And in the middle, um, falls in both directions. So how much of this is measurement error? We don't know exactly. One of the virtues of using a quintiles approach is that once you get one or two out, you're probably beyond measurement error, at least we hope so. Um, and um, so this is what it looks like, and this is a terrible slide, apologies in advance. <laughs> um, this is the whole mess of going one, one time point to another, and where, pe where people start, this is, your, this is starting at time t, where you are at t plus one. Basically, the dark bold, um, most people stay where they were in the previous, um, but it's just to note that we have about 50,000 observations to, to look at this. You can see the numbers get thin, but still not too bad with the extreme changes um, down to a couple hundred. Um, and here's the answer. <coughs> so if you um, job control and mental health, fixed effects within person, um, as you shift one quintile, it's about the same whether you treat the, the scale raw because it's about five points, or in quintiles, it's about a 0.4 change um, for each for each higher step in job control on the quintile scale, you go up about 0.4 in um, the mental component summary scale, which is pretty small. Um, and this is, you know, the virtue of big numbers is tight confidence intervals, but is it meaningful? Well, um, that's where treating, treating job control as a quintile, variable, quintile one is our reference, and then looking for a dose response. What we see is the difference between one and two goes up as you expect here, same as this one. Um, and then it does go up stepwise up to about one and a half points on the MCS scale um, if you went the difference between quintile one all the way to quintile five. Um, so <coughs> one of our problems, one of our worries here was, well, our job control measure isn't terribly good. Um, and some of you, those of you who work in this area will be aware of there's some evidence that um, the skill, discretion, and decision authority might be associated in different ways depending on the outcome. And what we did is then we looked at each scale <coughs> and we see both skill, discretion, and decision authority are associated in the same positive direction, though it's largely driven by decision authority in this analysis. Uh, and uh, we saw a similar stepwise uh, increase for decision authority in particular, as you just saw in the last slide. Um, the the Kibamaki group has shown uh, negative associations with mental health and some other outcomes, mortality outcomes for decision authority, but we're not seeing that in this one. Could you yeah. say what the uh, size of the scale is, what the range is for the MCS? 
Um, yeah. Mm. Zero to 70. Zero to 70 with a mean of about 50. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's small. We're getting to that. Um, uh, so in terms of looking at this, job control is usually stable within person over time, but you can have substantial changes. Um, better job control is associated with better mental health. Um, and this is a stronger evidence from observational data of a causal relationship than previous studies because of the within-person analysis and the evidence of dose response. Um, so qualitatively, it does support the case for improving job control as one of the elements of workplace mental health intervention. Um, well, what about this effect size, you know, Linda, per your, per your question? Well, a couple of things to say here. First, um, this effect size refers only to those who've been changing, who've, who've experienced different states of job control. So those who stayed in low control, when we do that analysis with a random effects model, we get sort of three to five point difference um, compared to those who stay in high control. Um, those, those who stay in low or high or medium, they drop out of this entirely. So really the virtue of the fixed effects is to try to get a little more causally robust estimate of whether there is a causal association, not what's the whole story of job control and mental health. Does that make sense? Um, and so um, that's the important thing. Um, and uh, also small effect size at the population level, you know, Jeffrey Rose's um, prevention argument, we're talking about population shifts, so it can, can still be significant at a population health level. And again, the limitations here, we're not considering sequence, duration, um, you know, uh, it's lots of exposure dynamics that other questions that could be asked. So this is only one of those. <laughs> All right, so that was, um, oops, yeah, that was, uh, that's the first. Now we'll go on to the second topic, which is temporary employment. Um, and I forgot to put the paper in there, but I can send it around with the notes um, uh, for, or the slides. So now let's go to temporary or precarious employment and health, mental health. In Australia, probably pretty similar here, I think, from memory. Look at some of um, Emil. Emil's not here, is he? Emil's papers, others. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Hello. Didn't see you come in. Um, probably a similar picture. Um, about 50% in permanent employment. Um, about 20 to 25% in casual, which I'll define in just a moment. These are low paid workers, um, no paid leave entitlements, and so on. Um, fixed term contract workers are around 7%. Those tend to be higher educated, higher paid. Labor hire workers will be essentially temporary but working for one parent company getting shifted around. They tend to be look socio-demographically like the casual workers, lower education, um, lower paid. And then we have about 15% self-employed <coughs> who are evenly split between those who run their own business, um, employing others, and their own account workers, uh, as they're called in Australia. A tradesman working out of his truck, a uh, woman doing cleaning, uh, a cleaning job, of, uh, a cleaning business of her own, for instance. Um, so casual means no paid or sick uh, annual leave, as mentioned, no formal commitment to hours. Um, and as you'll all be aware, there are health and safety concerns about these forms of employment, job security, uh, job insecurity, poor working conditions, poor regulatory oversight, and so on. Um, <coughs> and so there's been a lot of study on this, um, but it's a pretty mixed literature. There's um, some that show adverse effects, and again, depending on your outcome as well, um, but even mental health, some that show no association, some positive, some negative. Why? Well, there's definitional variation in terms of what precarious employment is and who's being compared to whom. <coughs> um, until recently, this is probably getting out of date now, there has been a paucity of prospective studies and of course, there's lots of confounding that can go on. People with poorer health tend to be selected into poorer jobs, and so, you know, chicken egg problem. Um, and then, differences between states or countries <coughs> can have hugely different labor protections and other things, um, which would probably figure into this association if there is one. And qualitative research suggests that the impacts could vary depending on your working life stage. If you're a prime wage earner for a family and you're casually employed, that's probably distressing. But if you're near retirement, maybe you've gone to casual employment voluntarily. Um, and that's what Martha Clark, this is a Toronto study in fact, isn't it? Martha with Wayne Luchuk, I think so. Um, 
And so uh, De Kuyper and some others just did a nice little review um, some years ago saying, look, you've got to weigh up everything here. The negatives and positives are temporary against the negatives and positives of quote unquote permanent, which we all know permanent isn't quite permanent anymore. We'll return to that point um, when we get to the results. <coughs> and so this is what we tried to, um, tried to do um, and integrated this background into these, this set of research questions. So the first one um, is a similar analysis to the job control and mental health. When you look at people who have experienced both permanent employment, which we're using as our reference, and temporary employment, are there differences in their mental health when they're in one state or the other? Straight fixed effects regression. But maybe it's if somebody transitions from permanent employment into temporary employment, maybe they, their mental health takes a dip there. That would, that's a different, slightly different question. So this is a change question. This is a state question, if you will. All right. The state of permanent versus, versus temporary, and then this, the transition from one to the other. And then along the qualitative work are these relationships, you know, is there effect measure modification by age or sex? All right. Um, so we've got two categories of increasing temporariness or precari precariousness, sorry, if you will. And that is casual being the most precarious compared to permanent, and then fixed term contract <coughs> being intermediate. So a lot of uh, myself, I was one of these workers till about a year ago, um, you know, working contract to contract. Um, but in a casual situation, you're, um, you can be let go the next day. Fixed term workers tend to have paid sick and annual leave, casual workers do not. So that gave us, if you will, two intermediate categories. So we're back to Hilda, and we look at these 10 waves. <coughs> and our source population for this analysis was about 80,000 observations from 15,000 workers. And at wave one, our distribution of forms of employment looks pretty similar to our ABS, or Australian Bureau of Statistics, labor hire stats. One point that I'll make <coughs> is because labor hire is a very small group, there they are at 2.5 week, and they look similar to casuals. We combined those in the casual group and kept fixed terms by themselves. That's just 7%. You can see the dominant form is still um, permanent. All right, so again, same outcome, um, same method. And to reiterate, looking at that state of casual versus permanent, and people who've, who've experienced both, or fixed term versus permanent, and then the transitions and effect modification. So um, the first question, you can see here, again, this is made up data, our same lovely characters. Um, you can see here that this person's mean mental health along here. Um, if you compare this person's mental health in permanent at one and then casual at zero, you can see that, look, it's not varying a lot. And with a straight fixed effects regression, you would miss this entirely. Does that make sense to people? Um, and hence, that's why we have the two questions. So on the first one, we could, we could easily miss this um, if there is a transition associated change in mental health. And the answer is um, we find nothing. There's no, um, no association. So this is first for comparing permanent to casual within person. Um, adjusting for education survey wave. Um, and we also looked at interactions between employment arrangement and age, employment arrangement and sex, nothing. Totally no. Um, no association. <coughs> Next, research question two. Let's focus on this window. So we go into the data set. We say somebody's got to have two waves of permanent followed by either casual <coughs> or fixed term. Those are the experiments we want to extract and see what happens. And you can see each of these two individuals, we'd be pulling out that, those two little blocks of data. And there, again, overall, no, nothing. No association. Um, effect modification by sex, nothing. Effect modification by age is significant, but you, know, you can look at it, make your own judgment. Error bars are all totally overlapping. Looks like a bit of a trend. Um, in probably the opposite direction. We were careful not to actually anticipate which direction it would go because we weren't really sure. But this is saying that with the transition from permanent to casual 
in your later working years, 55 to 64, your mental health will improve by about a point and a half. Um, interesting. So is that real or? Well, we'll come to that. Um, you can see there's an awful lot of a, a tangle of error bars there. So you have to take that with a bit of a grain of salt. When we look at the transition from permanent to fixed term, um, nothing. No main effects, no interactions, employment, arrangement, and sex. Nothing there at all. So basically the story is entirely null, but for one unanticipated uh, result of a small improvement for the oldest age group with the transition from permanent to casual. <coughs> and then <coughs> we went crazy with sensitivity analyses and um, adjusted for various other things, and the results didn't change, really. Skill level, income, change in job. Um, most of the people who contributed one of these little experiments only went through such a transition once. Um, but so we chucked out anyone who had two of those. Maybe they're a little different. Um, nothing. All very, very stable. So <coughs> to summarize then, there's no evidence of within person net differences in mental health in either of the two states of precarious employment that we looked at, casual or fixed term, compared to permanent. Um, and no evidence of a difference in that association by age or sex. No evidence of overall within person changes in mental health following the transition from permanent into casual or fixed term, with the exception of that small improvement for the oldest age group. Um, <coughs> again, results only generalized to those who've, ex who've experienced this change. There's one other study that used fixed effects regression in JETS a couple of years ago, and they didn't do the same exact. They, they used self reported. Uh, job security, basically, and saw um, small difference with the GHQ outcome, but no difference with transitions. Again, small. Um, that's the only thing we can compare this result to. Um, so lots of limitations, measurements only once annually. When did the transition occur? If it occurred at day one in the year and got measured at day 365, maybe that's a little different from transition occurring at day 364 and measurement happening at 365. Um, there's, of course, possible longer term or cumulative effects. We're only looking at one sort of particular set of exposure dynamics. There's no data on why people are in these forms of employment, which we really wish we had. This is a voluntary transition, involuntary. Um, self employment we didn't include because they're a bit heterogeneous with respect to temporariness or precariousness. You know, a small business owner um, compared to a tradie working out of his truck. But still, our results generalize to. to about 85 percent of the labor force. Um, <clears throat> so what do we make of this? An, uh, an optimistic interpretation is um, that this might be about the way Australia, uh, the social uh, the work and social welfare protections in Australia. Casual employment is recognized as quote unquote an inferior form. And so by law, there's supposed to be a loading or a premium of 15 to 25 percent on the hourly rate to make up for the fact that you don't get any paid leave. Um, the minimum wage in Australia is about $16 an hour. I don't know what it is here. It's not so good in America. It's what about between 5 and 10 in the States probably? 10, 10. all right. Yeah, so it's pretty good. Um, and this is what blows away my American colleagues. Uh, legislated minimum superannuation contribution, including for casuals, of 9%. Um, this is before you put any, anything in. Extraordinary, really. And of course, people are not dependent for health care on employment in Australia, uh, as opposed to some other places. So, you know, maybe these are labor market level effect modifiers. And maybe where these aren't in existence, we see that association that might occur. Um, and so these could be key policy levers for uh, mitigating any potential social or health impacts of temporary employment. <coughs> now, we can also take a not so optimistic view of what this means. Um, this, you know, 1.5 improvement in mental health with the transition for older workers. Um, we had both, uh, there's a Q's comp, this, this is a paper, uh, there was a qual study that was part of this project that was run over in Adelaide. And what they found was a lot of workers transitioning into casual, mid-career or later career, to escape pressures of full-time uh, permanent work. Um, and so 
this might be, might represent a recovery from stressful jobs. Don't know, um, but it's plausible. And we might also be looking at a narrowing of the contrast. Maybe some time ago, the difference between permanent and casual was larger, because in fact, conditions are converging, and permanent isn't so permanent anymore. Um, and so, you know, this, this may be the fact that we're seeing no association has to do with the converging of um, conditions. Uh, in Australia, over the last couple of decades, there's been a steady deterioration um, in employment regulation and protections. And of course, we're only talking about mental health here. Um, there are some Australian studies that show increased risk of injury associated with temporary employment. So the fact that mental health might not be harmed doesn't mean temporary employment is harmless, obviously. Um, and so there's those two. Do I know which it is? Well, I hope it's the first one, but I don't really know. Um, so what's, what emerges from this in terms of where we go next is, is really thinking about working life course stage and understanding the relationship, not just temporary employment and so on, but psychosocial work environment and health and mental health. Um, and this is kind of a no-brainer, I guess. We need to consider the negatives and positives of both permanent and, um, and temporary employment and their relationships on mental health, both in terms of theory and in design analysis. So, um, and that's the paper, um, which I can send around <coughs> to, uh, I can provide a couple of the papers from this um, that go out with the slides. So we've applied this method in a number of other studies, including one with Peter here on working hours. It's in press. We've looked at um, employment status and mental health uh, among uh, people working with a disability and showed about double the decline in mental health for a person working with disability versus a person working without disabilities, um, which we take to mean in a hopeful sense that employment is more meaningful um, to someone working with a disability versus not. Very active area of policy development in Australia with a new national disability insurance scheme. Um, so we're doing more work in that area. Um, <coughs> and we looked at sickness absence and uh, a scaled measure of psychosocial job quality and show an association there. Um, uh, in the same day, this is all Hilda. And then finally, working hours, we see um, small association there. So uh, to, to wrap up then, uh, natural experiments are a valuable complement to experimental studies, uh, especially we have feasibility, ethical, you know, various challenges. Um, and it adds value to routinely collected data, source, data sources. You go in with a good, clear, strong hypothesis and extract the data that you want. Um, you, can, you can actually add quite a bit of value. Um, obviously, can't replace um, intervention trials, uh, but uh, it's also a way to inform uh, the design of those intervention trials, and, and in and of themselves, they can also be valuable for policy and practice. Um, so fixed effects regression, when we have repeated measures data available, which isn't always the case, it's a causally robust analytic strategy um, for natural experiments. And the main features are that optimizing exchangeability by doing the within-person thing and eliminating all time invariant confounding. And that's starting to show up in the epi literature now. Tony Blakely taught us this. Tony's a methodologist from New Zealand. Um, there's probably a handful, four or five papers uh, in the work in mental health literature on fixed effects regression, and it's likely to grow. So anyway, um, word from our sponsors, <laughs> and thank you. <laughs>